to a med venture. Yes. Hello. Nice to meet you. I'm Oliver Stone. Nice to meet you. Oksana. Hello. Welcome. To my <laughs> Thank hotel. you. Thanks for joining me at my table. Nice place. And this interest in Ukraine. Why are you interested in Ukraine at all? Where is Ukraine? And where is America? Russia, big countries, big politics. And suddenly Ukraine? Because I care about war and peace, and I, I'm a citizen of the world. I was in Vietnam War. I don't want to see my country go down this militaristic path. I knew nothing about Ukraine until I interviewed uh, Mr. Uh, Putin. And I learned a lot about Ukraine and I worked on Ukraine on fire. Mr. Viktor Medvedchuk, I'm honored to be here to talk to you. So just to introduce yourself to people who don't know anything about you, can you just tell us a little bit about where you come from, who you are? You were born in the 1950s, right? Viktor Medvedchuk was born August 7th, 1954 in Pochot, Siberia, where his family was exiled. In 1978, Medvedchuk graduated from Kiev University with a degree in law. He soon rose to great heights in his profession. During the Soviet era, Medvedchuk was never a member of the Communist Party. Since 1990, he has been the head of the Lawyers' Union of Ukraine. During that period, he began to transition into the political arena. He was elected a member of the Ukrainian parliament, the Verkhovna Rada, where he served from March 1998 to April 2002. The Ukrainian economy showed its biggest growth during this time, reaching an impressive 12% per year. But after a new president came to power, the economy drastically stagnated, becoming a sixth of what it once was. Medvedchuk also had great success in the business world with his law firm BMI, soccer team Dinamo Kiev, and trading in the energy sector. He returned to his political and public life in 1998, eventually rising to the position of the first vice chairman of the parliament. He was the head of Ukrainian President Leonid Kuchma's administration from 2002 to 2005. He was in the opposition to both Presidents Yushchenko and Yanukovych who succeeded Kuchma. Medvedchuk is considered to be a close friend of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin is the godfather of Viktor's daughter, Daria. Yeah. Oh, well, I thought it was a big honor for you to be the godfather of his daughter. Ukraine uh, split from the Soviet Union in 1991. In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lowered for the last time, and an era comes to an end. Can you describe the moment? Myself, like many of my peers and the older generation people, we didn't know what the standard of living would be in Ukraine as in an independent state now. Gorbachev was on Ukrainian television, still arguing for a Moscow-based central government linking the parts of the old Soviet Union. Otherwise, he predicts anarchy. Although most people supported that path of independence, we thought the path of self-sufficiency and sovereignty would lead to greater success than it was in the Soviet Union. A 
On December 1st, 1991, at the Republican referendum, the population of Ukraine, by a majority vote, expressed support for secession from the USSR. On December 5th, the Beloveshkia agreements were signed and the Soviet Union stopped existing. In Ukraine, it seemed that after gaining independence, the Republic could in a short time become a prosperous European country. There were all reasons for this. A huge scientific and industrial potential, qualified specialists, developed agriculture, and the absence of inter-ethnic conflicts in Ukraine. The determination to be self-sufficient in practice has led to a reduction in relations with Russian partners that were worked out over the decades. 25 years after gaining independence, all illusions were dispelled. After the 2014 coup in Ukraine, there is no developed economy, no peace. Control over parts of the territories has been lost. I'm a supporter of a sovereignty of Ukraine, and I believe that the path that was chosen in 1991 was the right one. The governance of the country was and remains being incorrect, though. The problem is that people did not really benefit from sovereignty and independence. This really is a problem. And I gather that uh, because of your husband's uh, positions, you were blacklisted, so to speak. Being a wife of an opposition politician is very hard, especially in the last five years, when the Democrats, in quotes, came to power, in quotes, that preach democratic values. And they are ready with a hot iron to finish those who they don't like, who is undesirable and says something that they don't like. What about your, I mean, your show? What happened to your show, your colleagues, people who work with you? I have produced 13 seasons of the most successful shows in Ukraine. X Factor, Ukraine's Got Talent. But after the American sanctions were imposed against Victor, I was fired. And of course, it was a political punishment for me as a wife. And it is terrible that a family, the wife, in a democratic country are punished, in fact, for her husband. We are imposing sanctions on specific individuals responsible for undermining the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and government of Ukraine. You're also on the sanctions list, the United States sanctions list. I was one of the first put under US sanctions, one of the first in March 2014. The official White House documents indicated that I was subject to sanctions by the United States because, first, that I defended the principles of building a federal state structure in Ukraine. This is strange for a country that is a federation and against the Ukraine being federation. Interestingly, the views of Medvedchuk on the need to give more freedom to the regions of Ukraine are shared by the vice president of the USA, Biden. Anyway, on December 8, 2015, speaking in the Varhovna Rada in Kiev. Thank you very much. He practically repeated the ideas of the opposition leader of Ukraine. This issue of federalism is the thing that almost prevented our nation from coming into being. This is all because of disagreement with my position, which I state publicly and openly, and which neither the government nor the national radicals like. At first, I was very afraid. It was terrible when you were absorbed by this feeling. I asked Victor, let's leave. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians left, talented, promising. But Victor said, where would we go? This is my country. This is my homeland. This is my home. I can be disliked by someone. Someone can hate me. I will have a different opinion. But this is my country. I love it. Why should I leave? We stay. 
In 2018, Ukraine was already in a state of deep economic recession and political crisis. The Crimea was lost. In the east, a bloody war continued in the Donbass for four years. Two stable concepts have been formed in Ukrainian society. According to the first, Ukraine should set a course on complete political, economic, and cultural isolation from Russia. At the same time, within the country, it is necessary to eradicate any manifestations of anything Russian, including historical monument, religion, communication, and language. According to the second concept, Ukraine cannot and should not break relations with Russia, and the Russian-speaking population should have equal rights to preserve their customs, religion, and culture. Viktor Medvedchuk became an expression of this second concept. Since 2018, he has been one of the leaders of the For Life Opposition Bloc. The party represents the interests of the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine. Opposition Platform for Life is a political party in Ukraine founded in December 2018 with the aim to contest together the 2019 Ukrainian presidential election and then the 2019 Ukrainian parliamentary election. Government and our opponents call it pro-Russian. But it is incorrect. It is incorrect because people who live and who want to be friends with Russia, who are against the policy that the authorities profess in the form of radical Russophobia and anti-Russian hysteria, and want normal relations with our neighbors, people who stand for the values that, unfortunately, in recent years have disappeared. The solution, although it probably is impossible to get, would be to split, split Ukraine into west and east. A de facto division has always existed. When we talk about the west and east in the 90s, we proceeded from the fact that there is a split in Ukraine. It threatens to break up the country. Unfortunately, the process of disintegration has begun. The question is why? The fact is that Ukraine with its current borders is a territorial association. If we analyze the history of the last 10 centuries, then the territory of Ukraine was the territory of various regional associations. Since the 10th, 11th century, it was Kievan Rus, then the Golden Horde, then the Great Lithuanian Principality, which occupied most of today's territory of Ukraine. Then the Crimean Kahanat, the Kingdom of Hungary, Kingdom of Poland, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire. And all these territorial associations created their own culture here, implanted their faith and recognized certain historical facts. When you underline the fact which I oppose. Underline the fact that this would be more of a Lithuanian principality, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it was the Russian Empire. Therefore, there is a different faith, a different history, and different languages. The mistake of the current government, it tries to build a single identity out of this whole country where they speak different languages, where they practice different religions, where they have different assessments of historical facts, builds this identity on an identity, close only to the part of the people, the population, that part. This is a mistake that leads to nowhere. This is the biggest strategic mistake made by the authorities in Kiev today, because this identity will never establish itself throughout Ukraine. On April 25, 2019, the Verahovna Rada of Ukraine adopted a law according to which the only language that can be used in all spheres of life in Ukraine is the Ukrainian language. This law immediately provoked sharp criticism both inside and outside the country. 
Ukraine is a political state where the second language in importance and spread is the Russian language. By its decision, the Verahovna Rada announced a de facto ban for almost half of the country's citizens to use their native language. Experts suggest that further, the law, contrary to the European Charter of Languages, will be another factor in the split of society and in the future of the country. Yes, we will now learn English. Yeah, well, I understand that too, but you're yeah, trying to make it more European. You can't go against your nature. There are so many Ukrainians who are different traditional values, different values, and they're not going to, you don't have to, you don't have to force America down their throats. But you're getting the worst of America. You're getting the America as a debtor nation. You're losing your economy. You're going the, the worst of cap, the worst of capitalism, and you're going, you're going to go past the 1990s Russia. It's going to be, America is doing the same thing that they did to uh, Russia in the 1990s. I know you've said that Russia and Ukraine are two different countries that are united by history and by tradition. Both countries and people. And you made the point that you're two nations. Explain what you're thinking. These are two distinct nations proceeding from today and for the last 200 to 300 years. There is the Russian nation, there is the Ukrainian nation. But these are close nations. These are Slavic Orthodox peoples. This is the basis of civilization characteristics, community of Russia and Ukraine. If in general, we compare Ukraine and Russia, this is one thing. If we compare with the Western part of Ukraine, then this is a completely different thing. Imposing this position here, the influence on the position of the whole country is a mistake. We must understand that no matter how life develops further, I believe in it and firmly believe that we will still be neighbors. And most importantly, it should be so. Yeah, I understand. Mr. Putin may not agree completely. He feels that Ukraine is really a part of Russia, historically. Very close, I mean, very close. One people, two nations. You think it's one nation? Ну, конечно. Вот смотрите, it's, uh, когда it's вот эти земли, которые являются ядром Украины, присоединялись к России, это всего три области было. Киев, Киевская область, Северная область и Южная. Никто не считал себя чем-то другим, кроме как русским. Потому что в основе лежала что? Религиозная принадлежность. Yes. Это отношение, yeah. это, все были православны, yeah. и считали, и называли себя русскими. И они не хотели быть частью католического мира, yeah. куда их подтаскивала yeah. Польша. Значит, ну, я прекрасно даю себе отчет в том, что со временем yeah. вот эта идентичность этой части России, она как-то определилась, и люди имеют на это право. Это позднее начало использоваться для раскачки самой Российской империи. Но в, в основе своей истории и, и по той же религии огромного количества связей, причем родственных связей близких, это по сути один. По, по традициям очень, очень, очень много. При этом, если часть людей, которые проживают, значительная часть в Украине сегодня считают, что они должны бороться за подчеркивать свою идентичность, бороться за это. Ну, у нас в России никто против этого ничего не имеет. Я тоже. Но просто мы, имея в виду, что у нас много общего, мы можем использовать это как конкурентные преимущества при определенных интеграционных процессах. Это совершенно очевидный факт. Но сегодняшние власти этого явно не хотят. Но я думаю, что здравый смысл, он, он восторжествует в конце. И в конечном итоге все-таки мы придем к состоянию, о котором я сказал. Сближение не сделано. Сближение не сделано. Indeed, Mr. Putin said that they were not two nations, but one. I had long discussions with him about this. I think that he is inclined to my point of view. When I raise arguments, these are really two nations. He never said that this is one country. It used to be one country and was called the USSR. But this country does not exist. Today, there is an independent Russian Federation, an independent Ukraine, and other former republics of the Soviet Union. Did you 
jubilation on the streets of the Ukrainian capital as protesters took control of Kiev and President Viktor Yanukovych was impeached. On the 20th of February, 2014, on the main street of the Kiev, horrible things happened. And this was a point of no return to Ukraine as we know it. From the very early morning, unidentified shooters opened fire on the protesters and on law enforcement. Tensions were very high, and both sides were furious. President Viktor Yanukovych, special forces of Bearcut, and special security services forces were immediately blamed for the killings. Angry crowds of protesters began to attack the police. Who shot the uh, protesters? Do you have an idea? The first official government investigation started. Investigators accused special forces of Bearcut, Viktor Yanukovych, President Putin's assistant Vladislav Surkov, and Russian Spetsnaz. All the accusations were lacking one thing, evidence. Someone who has been gathering this evidence is Professor Ivan Kachanovsky from the University of Ottawa in Canada. Professor Kachanovsky kept investigating the events of the Maidan massacre during the last five years. In his extensive scientific research, based on a cross-examination of the video and audio files throughout the timeline of the shooting, he got much further in his investigation than all of the official teams together. This was quite unprecedented to have so many television cameras, basically, so many journalists following and witnessing such a mass killing. On mostly all television networks in the United States, in Canada, Ukraine, Germany, Poland, all different countries, with exception of Russia, it was presented basically as evidence that this was massacre by police. Here, police fire on protesters with AK-47s and sniper rifles. During the five years of official investigation of the Maidan massacre, very important facts were completely ignored. Snipers were located in buildings under the control of protesters. During the investigation, Professor Kochanowski discovered even more horrifying facts. And only recently, actually, I found a footage which was filmed by this Belgian television from Hotel Ukraine. This video shows they were walking to the spot of the massacre. They were not walking just on their own. They were led by two other protesters, who were very loudly calling them to this site. No reason to go there. And they were specifically called into this massacre spot. Victims were escorted to the places it was planned for them to be killed and filmed. In Professor Kuchinovsky's investigation that was based on scientifically organized analysis of all available video and audio recordings, he reached a conclusion. The Maidan massacre was key in a plan of an ongoing coup d'etat, and killings were planned in advance. There were two interviews published in the recent book by a Ukrainian pro-Maidan journalist. And in this book, they produced interviews of two far-right leaders of Ukraine. One was head of Svoboda party, and another was the deputy head of the parliament of Ukraine at the time of Maidan massacre, who was also one of the leaders of this far-right Svoboda party. And they and Maidan leaders met with some senior Western officials. And this Western official told them basically that killings of a few protesters is not enough for Western government to change support. They said specifically, end of recognition of Yanukovych government basically would change only if number of victims would be 100. The Western government policy changed immediately after Maidan massacre. Not an accident, because you have exactly 100 people who were killed. Over these four years, a lot of versions have been made public. A lot of television footage was filmed. 
about the fact that they were Georgian snipers, or that someone else did this in order to provoke confrontation and bloodshed. The fact it has not yet been established who started shooting at the protesters. And if this has not yet been accomplished in four and a half years, then as a person who understands a thing or two about law and criminal investigations, I can tell you that it will remain unresolved. Research has revealed there were snipers at the Maidan. The forensics were the angle of the shooting bodies of the police and the protesters. It was very badly investigated, not at all, really. But what evidence we have seems to point to there being Georgian snipers. I remember you were telling me about the Obama phone call. President Obama and Russian President Vladimir Putin still disagree on all the basic facts in Ukraine, but the two leaders are talking about a potential, and I must capitalize that word, potential resolution to this crisis. Obama and you had an agreement that there would be uh, no firing, and he gave you a promise that he would. No, you know, Obama is not president, but in any case, but murderers get away with murder after a successful coup d'etat. These events that occurred on Maidan, that started in the end of November and ended on February 21, 22, 2014, they were mostly predetermined as elements of external management, which were then actually implemented by Washington in Ukraine. First, non-governmental funds, organizations, and government officials represented by Mrs. Newland then by Vice President Biden, and by many others openly supported the escalation of violence, which resulted in the overthrow of power. The most interesting thing is that the armed actions, they really took place, and there were signs of a crime in these actions. These were serious crimes. <laughs> But when that happened, by the time they ended in February 21, 22, the government had already granted amnesty. So a law was passed that there would not be prosecution of people who participated in the protests. And according to this law, all participants were exonerated including those who committed crimes. Moreover, in Article 9 of this law, it is forbidden to collect personal data, meaning those who later came to power. So they established the ground in advance. So those who performed any criminal activity at that time couldn't be prosecuted. We understand that the seizure of power happened by force of arms, but no one ever took, nor will ever take, the responsibility for that. Legislative solution was adopted in this regard. I gave you the example of Article 9, of the law on amnesty of February 21st, 2014, for a reason where it is forbidden to collect personal data, 
and to record any actions that were related to those who protested. So to those people who could participate or organize what you call today using weapons. Nationalist groups, they burned your villa down. Basically, no. It was in February 2014, just in the heat of the events on Maidan. Yeah, but who burned it down? These were national radicals, yes. The fact is that over the years, the investigation pretended that the case was investigated, but they couldn't identify the perpetrators. So, uh, no justice? There is no justice in this matter, and in general. And probably, there is no point in expecting it, because this is not the only event that affected me or my family. Because in 2014 and 2015, there were attempts to occupy my office. And several times, my office was set on fire. This is all because of disagreement with my position, which I state publicly and openly, and which neither the government nor the national radicals like. By the way, the last attempt of setting my office on fire was several months ago, in September 2018. And the problem is that since 2014, the government has lost its very important function. As an expert in state building issues, I can say this function is the use of violence. So why do so many Ukrainians hate Russia so much? This is related to the processes that have occurred during these last four years. In order to bring this division, a split in relations between Russia and Ukraine. This is the policy of today's government, which has been elevated to the level of state policy. Resentment against Russia has been growing for a long time. Ukraine claimed the leading position in the entire post-Soviet era. One of the largest countries in Europe could not have been on the sidelines, but it was losing the competition for the leadership to Russia. And it was difficult for the awakened national consciousness to accept it. In addition, it quickly became clear that it was very convenient for Ukrainian politicians to blame all the mistakes in the economy on the non-constructive position of Russia. Until a certain time, disputes and rivalries did not go beyond the relationship of two brothers living in the neighborhood. However, with coming of nationalist President Yushchenko to power in 2005, the situation escalated. The anti-Russian policy of the Ukrainian leadership has become more pronounced and the propaganda pressure on the population has increased. However, this did not prevent millions of Ukrainians from moving to work in a richer and more stable Russia. Since December 2013, anti-Russian propaganda has become hysterical. During the days of confrontation on the Maidan, fake news was constantly spread. For example, the Russian special forces are allegedly already in Kiev and are preparing to use force against the protesters. The death of people on the Maidan was also readily associated with the presence of Russian special forces. When the situation is constantly escalating that Russia is to blame for everything, then it is perceived by the majority of the population as a fact that Russia is an aggressor. But today, the majority of the population of Ukraine considers Russia to be the aggressor. After losing Crimea, Russia is openly called an aggressor in Ukraine. Tearing away the whole region was painfully perceived by Ukrainian society, part of which grew and was formed in conditions of independence. The war in Donbass was also associated with Russian interference. Pro-government media kept telling that there were whole Russian divisions in Donbass. And it was them who bombarded the urban neighborhoods of Donetsk and Lugansk. The population of Ukraine willingly believed it. It is much easier to think of Russia as an aggressor than to accept the fact that the Ukrainian army is bombing and shelling Ukrainian cities. That the killed women and children are the victims of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian Nazi military formations. It was easier to blame Putin directly. Mr. Putin, you can win the fight against the troops. 
but you will never win the fight against the nation, United Ukrainian nation. So, Mr. Putin, who's uh, the godfather of your daughter, is the bad guy here, is the face of the enemy. It seems to me, from having talked to Mr. Putin, that he's been trying to keep a balance, trying to keep a lid on this violence. There is a great danger. I'm sure that Mr. Putin has pressure from his own nationalists who are unhappy with the situation. So he's trying to keep the peace. He's not just balancing. Putin's attitude to Ukraine is extremely positive. Well, you know, the И вторая часть этой истории — это пропаганда действующих властей в сегодняшней Украине, которая выставляет Россию виновницей всех последовавших за этим трагических событий. Мистер Медведчук был бы хорошим Думаю, да. Но у нас во многом разные позиции, разные точки зрения. Да, и он, я знаю его уже давно, он человек слова. Если он что-то говорит, in a move that has angered Russia and fueled massive uncertainty over the future of the war in Ukraine, President Donald Trump has approved the sale of lethal munitions to the Ukrainian government. Ukraine can be used to push against Russia. It sits right next door to Russia. And because there's a history of animosity between half of what was Ukraine and with Russia, they're able to really push on some real background animosity there that a lot of Americans just don't understand. It goes back generations. And the press's job in all of this hasn't been to report on it. It's been to cover it up. And anybody who actually looks at the facts of the Ukraine uh, coup in 2013 and 2014 can see how the US was directly involved. But it wasn't just an end in itself. It was a means to an end. And the end that they were going for is a way to antagonize Russia. We'll give Russia no chance to invade Ukraine. That's why we are doing everything possible to provide extra financing for the armed forces. And then when Russia responds in any way, then they can say, well, see, they're the aggressors. And they've done this over and over again. They've stirred up aggression against Russia, right at Russia's border, and then blamed Russia for anything that happened. This is an act of aggression by Russia, uh, that these were Ukrainian vessels traveling peacefully, seeking to go through the, the Kerch Straits to a Ukrainian port. On November 25th, 2018, the first armed incident between Ukraine and Russia took place in the Kerch Strait. A conflict that could have easily escalated into major hostilities. Ukrainian warships attempted to enter the Sea of Azov, violating the state maritime border, according to the Russian version. The Ukrainian side claims that its ships were in neutral waters. During the conflict, Russian border guards acted aggressively and used weapons. The ships of Ukraine were detained and the crews were arrested. I haven't seen you since the Kerch Strait. Any comments on that? The president, Mr. Poroshenko, made this provocation special in the pre-election campaign. He knew that he would not support him on the west and on the south. He used this provocation to make the situation for the situation and then the situation of the state. У меня есть основания полагать, что он хотел вообще ввести особое положение по всей стране. А может быть, отложить выборы в этой связи. Хотелось, чтобы не стал удержать власть. И, и, и искал любые средства для того, чтобы э, эту идею реализовать. Элемент агонии правящего режима. 
Even though Viktor Medvedchuk was in tough opposition to the administration of President Poroshenko, he went to Moscow to negotiate with Prime Minister Medvedev on the release of Ukrainian sailors. It wasn't the first time Medvedchuk engaged in the fate of Ukrainian prisoners. Practically, he fixes the passivity and inactivity of the Ukrainian official authorities by addressing humanitarian concerns. How often do you go down there to uh, Donbass? You know, I used to travel very often, have been to Donetsk and Lugansk. I had direct negotiations on the liberation of our citizens there, as well as in Moscow. So I have been engaged in negotiations, exchanges since December 2014. The Donetsk People's Republic government said that moving forward there can be no communication with Kiev other than prisoner swaps that might be in the pipeline. Only Russia could act as a mediator. I feel sorry for Ukraine because I don't quite understand all the forces that brought this division, this polarization of the country. From the American point of view, it's simply a button, a leverage point to use to excite the Russians and go after the Russians. So I, I, I would be very worried if I was anybody in the world, a citizen, that the United States is going to use this Ukraine thing at any moment to push the, towards a hot war. The whole world is watching you. That's a fact. They're watching you. Because their hopes for your success. You think that was a plan of the Wall Street people, of the Western people, where they wanted to make Ukraine a dumping ground? You know, I don't even have to speculate about it. I'm sure of it. At the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, many experts reasonably included Ukraine in the top 10 of the most developed countries in the world. Starting positions of the independent Ukraine were impressive. One third of the whole USSR industry, the largest Black Sea shipping company in the world, rocket, aviation, and space industry. As a result, after reckless economic reforms, after breakdown of economic relations with Russia and other post-Soviet countries, Ukraine had a failure. Since independence, its economy has shrunk by a third, ahead of the poorest countries in Europe. After 2014, Ukraine took a sharp turn towards decommunization. Memories of the Soviet time fade one by one. But together with the monuments, Ukraine is parting with its industrial grandeur. OK, what happens? So Wall Street people make money on this. Does Ukraine become a junk bond? Do they trade the future of Ukraine on stock market? Ukraine, as part of the Soviet Union, was the largest republic in the production of locomotives and diesel locomotives. Deindustrialization in Ukraine led to the fact that we now purchase these diesel locomotives from the United States of America. Who benefits, Mr. Stone? This is beneficial to those who today are lobbying illegal methods affecting economic integration, the sale of their products. Five years after the Revolution of Dignity, suddenly it became clear to everyone the West is not going to open its sales markets to Ukraine. Nobody needed to have unexpected competitors. It was much more profitable to force the Ukrainians to eliminate their potential. Ukraine used to be one of the few countries that could produce aircraft carriers. Now there is no shipbuilding in Ukraine. Ukraine used to create space rockets. Now it has no space industry, no aircraft industry. Ukraine doesn't have its own automotive industry. The military industrial complex once brought up to $3 billion annually to the budget. Today, most of the enterprises are closed. Some of the enterprises are located in territory, not controlled by Kiev. Naturally, to say that today we are trying to export these products, these amounts are insignificant, which, of course, cannot come close to what it was before. Because the less we produce, the more we will purchase. That this is one of the elements of this external expansion. An external management that Washington has introduced in relation to Ukraine since 2014. 
Jeez, looks fantastic. Another amazing experiment over common sense was the coal scam. Ukraine, which has rich coal deposits in the Donbass, has suddenly turned from an exporter into an importer of coal. It seems that in Kiev and Washington, they agreed to give a new meaning to the saying to carry coal to Newcastle. After the start of the conflict in the Donbass, Kiev definitely refused to buy Donetsk coal and decided to replace it with imported coal from the USA and South Africa. It was possible to buy it in Russia, but the politics took over. The second example, Pennsylvanian coal is much more expensive than Russian coal, and it is more expensive than coal from South Africa. And can you imagine the difference in transportation logistics? Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine and the United States of America, and Ukraine and South Africa. At the same time, today we buy 63% of coal imports from Russia. And we already buy 30% of all imported coal from the United States of America. Is this not the result of what you ask about? Is it not the result of who benefits? Who does it? Those who benefit from the sale of their products in Ukraine. In order to avoid domestic production, so that the country from the manufacturer turned into the country of the acquirer and the buyer. That's what the benefit is. Is there any uh, oil, gas? There's nothing here. You know, we have oil and gas everywhere, but we do not produce it. It needs to be developed. Therefore, Ukraine is rich in resources. But resources require investments that must be made in the economy of Ukraine in order to extract these minerals. But the situation with the investment and investment climate in the country is extremely bad. The economy is not developing. The investment climate has not been created. There is pressure from the administrative resource. Raider seizure of business. The lack of a fair judicial system. So who would invest? However, there were brave people who decided to invest in Ukrainian oil. The attention of world media is attracted by one company, Burisma Holdings. There are very, very interesting people on the board of directors of Burisma. For example, Hunter Biden is the son of the vice president of the United States. Of course, this state of affairs is welcome, but one detail interferes. The son of the US vice president received his post almost immediately after the official visit of his father to Ukraine, in the light of obvious interest of Biden Sr. in everything that is happening in Ukraine. Well, Ex-Vice President Joe Biden, his son Hunter Biden has a deal in Ukraine, explain that. Yes. His son was and remains on the board of directors of one of the companies that is engaged in oil and gas production in Ukraine. So this also explains the economic interests of the Biden family. Not only the son, but probably his high-ranking father as well. Perhaps this was precisely what allowed Mr. Biden, when he was as curator, when he was in power, curator from the side of Washington in Ukraine. He actually behaved like a person representing not only the country that introduced external management, but it was a representative or leader of the metropolis in relation to the colony, where the colony was, unfortunately, my country. And his speech in the parliament, I remember it very well. Thank you very much. It was not just instructive. It was a speech in which he said what to do and how to do it. And when stating his position, he didn't base it on argument or explanation, but on the fact that this decision was made somewhere overseas. The office of the general prosecutor desperately needs reform. The judiciary should be overhauled. The energy sector needs to be competitive, ruled by market principles, not sweetheart deals. And you, the so-called legislature, before whom he speaks, should implement this policy. Ukraine needs a budget that's consistent with your IMF commitments. Anything else will jeopardize Ukraine's hard-won progress and drive down the support for Ukraine from the international community, which is always tenuous. On March 22, 2019, Ukrainian politicians from the opposition, Viktor Medvedchuk and Yuri Boyko, met in Moscow with Prime Minister Medvedev. 
It was about the conclusion of a new gas contract between Russia and Ukraine, as well as the transit of gas through its territory. Interestingly, on behalf of Ukraine, negotiations were not conducted by officials, but it could not have been otherwise. Until 2014, Ukraine was almost completely dependent on Russian supplies. However, due to disputes over the price of gas, as well as for political reasons, Ukraine does without direct gas supplies from the Russian Federation. In fact, as Ukrainian politicians themselves have already recognized, in the reverse mode. Through the special schemes, the same gas is purchased from Gazprom supplies to the EU, but through European intermediaries, for example, through Poland. As a result, over four years, the price of gas for the population increased by 1,079%. That is the price citizens of Ukraine have to pay for fictitious gas independence. And then, a bilateral economic war began. The thing is that Ukraine joined the EU sanctions against Russia, and Russia imposed counter sanctions against Ukraine. And this dealt another crushing blow to the economic abilities of selling Ukraine's products to the markets of Russia and the CIS countries. Fortunately, has not found a replacement for these markets. And 30% of the uh, budget goes to pay the debt. These are financial burdens that even a normal economy cannot withstand let alone a state that is in deep crisis. I want to tell you that along with deindustrialization, we are still in a process that the authorities and our media do not notice. This is another process. It is called deintellectualization. Why? This is due to the harmful negative educational system introduced in Ukraine. This is due to the lack of scientific and technical development today because science and the introduction of new technologies is not actually financed in the country. And naturally, the brain drain goes along the line of finding use for these brains. Deindustrialization led to the closure of tens of thousands of large and medium-sized enterprises. And after that, people were looking for work. And today, they are looking for it in Russia, in Poland, in Europe. They left because they couldn't financially support their families in Ukraine. I set up the foundation in Ukraine in 1990, which was two years before the independence of Ukraine. Where does George Soros figure in all this? Unfortunately, everywhere. If we talked about some positive results from the activities of this gentleman, then we should have noted some success. But his activity is mainly focused on those countries, where he took an active position with his various funds. We remember the countries in North Africa, where the Arab Spring happened. Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt. We remember the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan. We remember the Rose Revolution in Georgia. We remember the Orange Revolution in 2004. And finally, the consequences of not only the Orange Revolution, but also the Revolution of Dignity of 2013 and 2014. This is also his activity. He did not stop. He continued to operate in 2015 and 2016. the Russians were successful. They accomplished what they set out to do. They had an objective to sow discord and divisiveness within our society at large, and to help uh, Donald Trump, and they succeeded. The biggest mistake people make when talking about the Trump-Russia collusion, sort of MSNBC Russiagate narrative. The Kremlin offered dirt to the Trump campaign. The president's campaign said yes to that offer. That's no longer an open question. All that stuff has now been proven. They think that it started election night 2016. In fact, it's part of a much longer series of events. When Barack Obama was elected. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. Hillary Clinton comes in as Secretary of State. I just wanted to have a chance to publicly say thank you. I think Hillary will go down as one of the finest Secretary of States we've had. 
And at that point, she sets up a private email system. I think now it's pretty clear that part of what was going on is they were setting up the underpinnings that would set up the Madonna. She introduced a program called Civil Society 2.0. And what we've done with Secretary Clinton's Civil Society 2.0 program is we've taken one of America's undeniable strengths, the strength of our technology and of our innovators, and we've put them to work in service of our diplomatic goals. This is a way for the U.S. government to work directly with NGOs like International Renaissance, funded by George Soros. And while working with those NGOs, fund money to them, but also training. And the kind of training that would be used when the Madan would start. I am the Ukrainian, the native of Kiev. And now I am on Maidan. I want you to know why thousands of people all over my country are on the streets. The direct involvement of this, we don't know anything about because Hillary Clinton's emails were all hidden from us. That Civil Society 2.0 program shows that they understand that cyber technology, that smartphones, and all of that technology, the tactics of activism were changing. The scandal that has become well known throughout the world, which for some reason is called Russia's intervention in the US presidential election erupted in Ukraine. They're calling it the digital equivalent of 9-11. A new report from the U.S. intelligence community says that Putin and the Russian government conspired to help President-elect Donald Trump's election chances. This is an electronic Watergate. Russia did not help me. The FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Obviously, Russia has been accused and accused over and over again of interference in the 2016 election. But now in the U.S., there's been investigation about Ukraine's interference in the election. It was a very confusing situation. Poroshenko seems to have been very strongly pro-Clinton, anti-Trump. Do you think there was interference? for some reason, we are talking about the interference of Russia, associated primarily with the former campaign chairman of the then presidential candidate, Donald Trump, Mr. Paul Manafort. In this scandal, which erupted in Ukraine, he played an organizational and ideological function. Let's talk about this new reporting from the New York Times this morning about Paul Manafort and his dealings in the Ukraine. In order to organize this scandal, to discredit the presidential candidate and his campaign, which he actually managed, Mr. Manafort was removed from power of the head of staff. Last August, a jury convicted Manafort of eight felonies, including tax and bank fraud. One month later, he pleaded guilty to two more counts of conspiracy and agreed to cooperate with the Russia investigation in exchange for a lighter sentence. Paul Manafort, he was consulting with the Party of Regions. The Party of Regions is a political party of Ukraine created in late 1997 that then grew to be the biggest party of Ukraine between 2006 and 2014. So Andrew Kramer publishes a story in the New York Times about Paul Manafort's name being found in this black ledger. Sergei Lyshenko is a Ukrainian journalist turned lawmaker who staked his career on fighting corruption. It used to be office of Paul Manafort. This, he says, is where a potentially crucial bit of evidence was found, a suspicious invoice that appears to be personally signed by Paul Manafort. So the person who put the accusation forward about Manafort 
with Sergei Leschenko. Today I present the documents uh, signed by Paul Manafort. Leschenko, he has the image. I call it primitively inaccurate, the fighter of corruption. The problem of corruption, this is the problem of the whole period of Ukrainian independence. But he fights against corruption following orders. There is an order to fight with a corrupt person. He fights. If not, he does not. He has lost a lot of slander lawsuits directed against him. Because often, some of the information that he has presented, considering his authority as a journalist, is not simply implausible, it is deceitful. It was he who, as a member of parliament, as a former journalist, was instructed to make these records public from this ledger of the Party of Regions. The interesting fact of the matter is that when the story of the so-called ledger of the Party of Regions came to light, and when he first reported about it, there was no mention of Paul Manafort. He spoke about other people. That is, there was a test run for the main strike. All this was done with one goal, to strike at the presidential candidate, Donald Trump. Why am I sure about this? I have good arguments for this. Because in this ledger, there were the names of hundreds of people for these four years. There were huge amounts, tens of millions of dollars, many tens of millions of dollars. There were specific people where not only their names were indicated, but also a personal signature that they received the money informally. No criminal cases have been investigated on these records yet. No one has been prosecuted. Hence, the conclusion is that this was done for a concentrated, focused strike against the main target. This main target, which was dictated from overseas, was called presidential candidate Donald Trump. Sergei Lyshenko and his anti-corruption team have every reason to want to see Donald Trump defeated this election because of his support for Russia, which is currently at war with Ukraine. And this is the point in the story where the music changes and gets ominous and dark. And it succeeded. Manafort was removed as the campaign chairman. Such things can't happen in the autonomous mode. They can take place only if the authority gave the green light. Therefore, these actions cannot be regarded as nothing other than an interference, especially as interference, as a term is very popular. Russian. Russian. Russia. Russia. Russian. Russian election interference. Russian witch hunt. We're talking about if you want to get elected. Listen, the country is a huge country. Yeah. With its main problems. With its problems. Со своими представлениями о том, что хорошо, что плохо. С пониманием того, что для среднего класса за предыдущие несколько лет, 10 лет, допустим, при огромном росте благосостояния правящего класса и богатых людей, для среднего класса ничего не поменялось в лучшую сторону. И именно это обстоятельство поняли те, кто вел предвыборную кампанию господина Трампа, и он сам понял. И он отработал на, это, на этой площадке. И какие бы наши блогеры, я не знаю, кто там, кто работает в интернете, как бы не высказывали свою точку зрения по поводу ситуации в США, это не могло сыграть ключевую решающую роль. Это чушь собачья. They just talk about it mostly when it comes to Russia's interference with the U.S. presidential elections. But in this case, even the court found that these actions were illegal, which influenced the electoral process. I am sure that Mr. Soros is behind this, too. Because this is a team of Democrats, Newland, Soros, Biden, in favor of the interests of Hillary Clinton, did everything to prevent Mr. Trump from being elected in the 2016 elections. People use the word dossier, and it has such an official sound to it. I mean, let, let's just call it for what it is. Rank hearsay put together by an FBI source who was later defrocked, paid for by the Democrat National Committee, and oh, by the way, Christopher Steele hated Donald Trump too. Throughout the summer of 2016, Victoria Newland was being updated by Christopher Steele. In early 2018, Victoria Newland admitted that she'd been being briefed by Christopher Steele. 
She talked openly about it on CBS's Face the Nation. During the Ukraine crisis in 2014 and 15, uh, Chris Steele had a number of commercial clients who were asking him for reports on what was going on in Russia, what was going on in Ukraine. Why is that? Okay, my conjecture here, they were concerned. They wanted to get ahead of the reporting and explain why they were talking to Christopher Steele. Uh, Chris had a friend at the State Department and he offered us that reporting uh, free so that we could also benefit from it. Victoria Newland said, I immediately urged him to go to the FBI. In the middle of July, when he was doing this other work and became concerned. The dossier. The dossier. Uh, he passed uh, two to four pages of short points of what he was finding. And our immediate reaction to that was, this is not in our purview. This needs to go to the FBI. And you'll find a spate of people who urged Christopher Steele to go to the FBI. John McCain urged him to go to the FBI. Everybody urged him to go to the FBI. And why is that? I think they're setting up a cover story. They want to say, we told him to go to the FBI. I think, in fact, what they were doing was setting up the information operation. I used to work in the Ukrainian embassy here in Washington, 2015, 2016. And uh, one day I was uh, approached by uh, the DCM of the Ukrainian embassy, Oksana Shridar, asking me to meet a person she knows very well. And I met with a DNC operative, uh, Alexander Chalupa. Alexander Chalupa, who is a lawyer, she had worked in the Bill Clinton administration as an intern. She'd been a DNC operative for about 12 years. And she's a Ukrainian American whose mother was deeply involved in politics. In 2015, Alexandra Chalupa and her sister start campaigning very hard against Paul Manafort. This is who Paul Manafort is. He is a, a, a puppet master of some of the most vile dictators around the world. Manafort was from Connecticut. They went to Connecticut and protested against him. It's not clear to me exactly why he was being targeted, but Alexandra Lupa said she was pulled out of retirement to, to work on this. She was asking more information on uh, dirt, that's how she put it, uh, to get Trump off the campaign in uh, September, October of 2016, right before the elections. Most of the key evidence that shows the collusion between the Ukrainian government and the DNC, operatives of the DNC, came in an article that was actually published in Politico before the inauguration. Ken Vogel and David Stern wrote an article in Politico that talked about how the Ukrainian government had tried to collude and interfere on behalf of Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. And furthermore, how Petro Poroshenko was very worried that the Trump administration would figure out they'd been working against him. And anybody who's watched Donald Trump for a few minutes uh, knows he's fairly vengeful to people he feel has wronged him. John McCain received a, uh, a fake and phony dossier. Do you hear about the dossier? It was paid for by crooked Hillary Clinton, right? And John McCain got it. He got it. And what did he do? Didn't call me. He turned it over to the FBI, hoping to put me in jeopardy. And uh, that's not the nicest thing to do. So Petro Poroshenko was concerned that that would happen. Two reasons. One, because of the arms deals and the economic deals and the loans. But also personally, Petro Poroshenko, since he'd been elected, had become a very unpopular president. At one point, I think his approval rating dipped down under 10%, a shockingly low number. In fact, polls showed that Ukraine has the least confidence in their government of any country on the face of the earth. So after Poroshenko was put into power by the United States, things had been disastrous for Ukraine. So Poroshenko was also worried that if he could not withstand a re-election bid, that he was gonna have Donald Trump in the West mad at him. And you can see his fears evolving. The first thing they tried to do was make sure they patched up things diplomatically for Ukraine. But then later, he started to throw people under the bus just to protect himself. Because it was a failure of Ukraine's foreign policy. The interesting thing is that the court acknowledged the fact of interference by such actions in the U.S. electoral process. 
I heard the accusations of Russia interfering in the U.S. electoral process, which is not confirmed by real evidence. There is a court decision. Moreover, this court decision established the illegitimacy, but it has also been established that the actions of these individuals as citizens of Ukraine caused significant harm to the foreign policy of Ukraine. So in the spring of 2016, Alexander Chalupa goes to the Ukrainian embassy in Georgetown, and she's introduced to Andrei Tolichenko. And he's introduced to Alexander Chalupa by the ambassador, Chali. And Alexander Chalupa tells Andrei Tolichenko that she's trying to dig up dirt on Donald Trump and Russia and trying to dig up dirt on Paul Manafort and Russia. She actually did want to use this information not for some intelligence purpose or uh, legal purpose. She did want to use it to interfere in an election. From what, from what I saw, yes. Alexandra Chalupa admits this in that article for Politico. She doesn't deny that at all. She also tells Tolichenko that she doesn't want him to coordinate or help the Trump campaign in any way. Now, Tolchenko, he's a loyal Ukrainian who's been part of the Madan. He doesn't like this. He thinks it's illegal and he thinks it's stupid. He thinks it's stupid because if you bet on the wrong horse, this could come back to haunt you. He turned out to be exactly right. He went to the ambassador, Charlie, and said, this is illegal. I don't want to be any part of this. Charlie yells at him. He gets in trouble. He leaves the embassy about a month later, goes back to Ukraine. Cut to Trump gets elected. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. Now, Ken Vogel and David Stern at Politico, they've caught wind that the Ukrainian government had colluded with the DNC to intervene on behalf of Hillary Clinton. And they start to do a very well-researched story. They talk to Andrei Telechenko. They get denials from Charlie. But the story is reported once, and then it's completely forgotten. And you'd think it would be significant. There was one key piece of evidence in the Politico story. It's the most important piece of evidence in this whole thing, is the email that WikiLeaks would publish. And this is an email from Alexander Chalupa, the DNC operative, to Luis Miranda, who is the comms director of the DNC. Let me explain why Luis Miranda is important. Very significant. The Hillary Clinton campaign had actually taken over the DNC back in 2015. So when you see Alexandra Chalupa reporting directly to Luis Miranda, that means she is reporting through one layer of separation to the Clinton campaign itself, not just to the DNC. In that email, Alexandra Chalupa brags that she has arranged to speak about Paul Manafort and that she's gonna have his Ukrainian journalists go back and dig up dirt on him. Now, that completely violates what you're supposed to do with the Open World Leadership Center. The Open World Leadership Foundation is a part of the Library of Congress. Because they're part of the Library of Congress, they're not supposed to be involved in election issues. And it was confirmed to me by the people at the Open World Leadership Center that they had, in fact, warned Alexander Chalupa, don't do that. The other thing that's significant there is that Chalupa reveals that she was with reporter Michael Isakoff. Now, Michael Isakoff is legendary in Washington, D.C. He's well known as a bulldog investigative journalist who worked on the Monica Lewinsky story, for instance. And he is hanging around with Alexandra Chalupa throughout the entire 2016 election. In fact, right before the election, when everybody thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, he publishes an article where he names Alexander Chalupa as one of the most important people in the 2016 election. To me, the most interesting thing about that group of journalists was those journalists were chosen by the embassy in Kyiv. In other words, those journalists were picked by and sent by the U.S. State Department. And that's part of the evidence that the State Department was involved at the deepest level in this election collusion and interference. In December of 2018, both Leschenko and the head of Naboo were convicted in a Kiev court 
of election interference. Що ні я особисто, ні будь-хто із працівників антикорупційного бюро України жодним чином не впливав і не міг впливати на процес проведення виборів президента Сполучених Штатів Америки. Я думаю, що так. Я ж йому дуже допомагав. Не йому, а я хіло допомагав. The unindicted co-conspirator there was Petro Poroshenko himself. Poroshenko was so worried that the Trump administration would pin stuff on him, started to throw Leschenko and Nabu under the bus. It was a form of misdirection. He didn't want the Trump administration to realize his direct involvement. Will your relationship with the U.S. changed now that President Donald Trump will be in the White House come five days from now? Look, Ukraine during the last three, day, three years uh, gained a very strong bilateral support in the United States. Trump gave a photo opportunity to Poroshenko. It's a great honor to have you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trump did not like Poroshenko. Why? Why not? I think, first of all, because Poroshenko had his own position during the U.S. election campaign. He supported Hillary Clinton, and he did it openly. Why openly? Because the ambassador of Ukraine to the USA, Mr. Chali, openly supported the representatives of the Democrats. Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. You need Biden for an attaboy and to get the deeds to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. Mr. Yatsenyuk, whom we recalled, spoke frankly, and in these words of Trump's assessments, there were insults. He stated that the USA as a powerful country deserves to have an intelligent, intellectually developed president. In other words, he doubted these qualities as inherent to Mr. Trump. Mr. Avakov, a representative of the same Yatsenyuk party, the Minister of the Interior, stated that Trump is a marginal politician. This altogether meant the one-sided position of Ukraine in the U.S. elections, which is exactly what should not be done by any country in the world. When what happened happened, Mr. Donald Trump won the election. It was a shock for the Kiev authorities and for those individuals that I listed. They were confident that this victory would never take place. I think that if what you are saying is true, that Trump thinks badly of Mr. Poroshenko, then there were real reasons for this. So, Mr. President, may God bless you and your colleagues and the people of Ukraine. And may God bless the United States of America in being able to continue to help you in your efforts. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Biden. So I came about this by accident investigating Ukrainian collusion with Democrats to affect the election. And over the next three to four months, you're going to find out all about that. So oh. I've decided I'm not going to go to the Ukraine. You're not going to go? I'm not going to go because I think I'm walking into a group of people that are enemies of the president, in some cases enemies of the United States, and in one case, an already convicted person who has been found to be involved in assisting the Democrats with the 2016 election. I'll give you his name, a gentleman by the name of Lyshenko. After two years of ignoring this news, ignoring the fact of Ukraine's interference in the elections in the United States, Ukraine Gate began to attract the attention of political heavyweights. I will step back and I'll just watch it unfold. In 1997, a man who did a lot to determine U.S. foreign policy, Zbigniew Bajinsky said, Ukraine is a new and important spot on the Eurasian chessboard. It is a geopolitical center because its very existence as an independent state helps to transform Russia. In the book, The Grand Chessboard, he wrote a lot about Ukraine, but always in the same way. Ukraine is a means of pressure on Russia, no more and no less.
The border between Ukraine and Russia is 2,300 kilometers. Any destabilization in Ukraine affects the interests of Russia. And the external influence of Washington in Ukraine makes it possible to manage the processes of destabilization that directly affects Russia. If you look at what happened to Ukraine in the 21st century, there is a feeling of deja vu. It's as if we are a part of the well-known legend about the Pied Piper, who led the charmed children to go nowhere. Millions of people were deluded by the sweet promises of rapid prosperity with the help of the United States and Western Europe. Very little time passed after the so-called revolution of dignity, and all expectations have collapsed. Instead of prosperity, there is the collapse of the economy, mass exodus of people from the country, and the death of now thousands of people. And the most important thing, Ukraine is in confrontation with Russia. The function that its real owners left for Ukraine works flawlessly. Anybody who actually looks at the facts of the Ukraine uh, coup in 2013 and 2014 can see how the U.S. was directly involved. But it, it wasn't just an end in itself. It was a means to an end. And the end that they were going for is a way to antagonize Russia. They've stirred up aggression against Russia, right at Russia's border, and then blamed Russia for anything that happened. But it's always interesting. Do puppeteers understand that sometimes puppets begin to live their own lives? The fact of Ukraine's interference in the elections in the United States is the first wake-up call. And then, war between Ukraine and Russia. Yesterday, it was unthinkable. Today, it is a probable scenario. It doesn't matter who starts first. It is important to note that the shockwave from the first explosion has spread too wide and affects those who prefer to wait out on the side. Does the Pied Piper who leads those who believe him further and further to nowhere understand that Russia will never accept a hostile state near its borders? Sounds like you've had a tough few years, sir. A hard time. The following years will be difficult, and I would say that especially 2019 will not be easy for Ukraine. Are you afraid of something? Yes. The world blowing up. One day, that gunshot could be heard. For example, the Ukrainian military boats could again try to break the borders that Russia considers its own, and thereby provoke response fire from the Russian border guards. It's the Russian military going head to head against the Ukrainian military. There will be victims. Russian President Vladimir Putin blamed the Ukrainian government for the crisis. And then the war begins in which Russia will naturally be declared the aggressor. Fighting has intensified. Russia has set off an international crisis. In Ukraine, Russia is now at war there. Ukrainian tanks will move to the Donbass in order to destroy the unrecognized republics with one blow. Will President Trump finally confront Putin's act of aggression against Ukraine? And in order to save citizens, Russian troops will come forward to meet them. The Hungarian army will defend the Hungarian citizens living in the west of Ukraine. The mayor has declared a humanitarian crisis and has appealed to the United Nations for help. Poland will announce the mobilization of reservists. There will be a real chance to return the lands that were torn off by the Soviet Union in 1939. UN Security Council will hold an emergency session on the Ukraine crisis. And what the whole world feared during the Cold War will happen. Moscow's, Brussels, and Washington's bad dream will come true. We want to return now to some breaking news this morning. We're just learning about the movement of the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz and four other ships. No one wants a full-scale war. For those who are still in control in Kiev, the only way to avoid defeat and destruction is to organize a provocation. The armies of Russia and NATO will come into military conflict. This will be the beginning of a withering Armageddon. Only scorched earth will remain in place of Ukraine. The world will be engulfed in a giant flame. Probably the last war for humanity. Just because someone in Kiev really wants to remain in power.
so nothing good will happen. Well, uh, does he see this historically? As, does he see these two countries coming together again? Я думаю, что это неизбежно. Во всяком случае, неизбежно строительство нормальных дружеских, я бы даже сказал, более чем дружеских, союзнических отношений. И, и в конечном итоге все-таки мы придем к состоянию, о котором я сказал. Сближение неизбежно. Ukraine will have two election campaigns that predetermine the country's place in the world, and most importantly, power in Ukraine. That is, new opportunities are opening up for Ukraine. The new president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, won because he promised to stop the war in the Donbass. One order of the commander-in-chief is enough for the war to be ended and thousands of human lives could be saved. No one can prevent him from giving such an order. But the days go by, and there is still no peace. The hopes of Ukrainians for the new course are fading with each passing day. The opportunity to improve this situation is to elect politicians to the parliament of Ukraine who are able to fulfill their promises to the people of Ukraine. In припинення вогню на Донбасі. Я розпускаю Верховну Раду восьмого скликання. We have a parliamentary presidential form of government. And therefore, having won the parliamentary elections, holding a faction that can influence all processes in the country, есть убеждение в этом в этом все я допустим я могу с чем-то не соглашаться но но это не может не вызывать уважения но во всяком случае он относится к такой категории людей которые выступают за независимость за укрепление независимой украины но в то же время считает что этого эффективнее добиваться путем развития сотрудничества с Россией. Ну, и я думаю, что он в значительной степени прав. We use the life principle with Oksana. Do what should be done, and everything will be as it is supposed to be. I think this is the right way of life. The right life principle. And we have to implement it.